All right, welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, today we're joined by Eliza Kempton, who's come to us from uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Eliza uh, did a uh, BS in physics at Middlebury College in uh, Vermont, uh, and then uh, did her PhD at Harvard University uh, in astronomy, uh, where she worked on uh, detecting uh, and characterizing Earth-like uh, exoplanets uh, with uh, Dmitry Sasilov and... Uh, Sarah Seeger. And then uh, a couple of years ago, she, uh, when she finished her PhD, she came across on a Sagan postdoc uh, to UC Santa Cruz. Uh, she uh, has published uh, research looking at most telescope uh, data, looking at the HD 209458 system. Uh, and uh, she has also looked at the spectra of protoplanetary collisions. And um, what she's going to talk to us today about is uh, analyzing uh, the atmosphere of GJ1214b. Uh, so if you'll join me in welcoming Eliza. Great. Thanks, Adrian. And, and thank you for inviting me here today. Um, can I take a quick census? So uh, how many people in the audience would identify themselves as a scientist? And how many would identify themselves as an interested member of the public? Okay, good. So we have some of each. This is good. I'm going to try to I'm going to try to keep it at the right level so that everyone gets something out of this. Um, all right. So uh, in the next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you about the atmosphere of a very exciting super Earth, and a super Earth is a planet that is somewhat larger or more massive than the Earth itself, which I will uh, get to in a moment. Um, this planet is called GJ 1214b. Uh, it turns out this planet is not Earth-like at all, um, but it's very interesting, and, and learning about the atmosphere of this planet is paving the way towards eventually learning about the atmospheres of planets that are actually smaller, uh, truly Earth-like planets uh, down the road. Um, but first, I want to give you a little bit of background, just general background on extrasolar planets, what we know about exoplanets. Um, and what we know about super-Earths. Um, so to start off with, I'm going to take you back uh, 16 years or so uh, to 1995 uh, with the detection of the very first known uh, extrasolar planet. Uh, this is, the planet's called 51 Peg B. It orbits a star called 51 Peg. So uh, the way that we name extrasolar planets is, is sort of boring, but um, we, uh, we name them after the star that they orbit around, um, and, then, and then we call the planet... We, give the planet the letter B. And if we found another planet in the system, it would be called 51 peg C, D, and so on and so forth. Um, so 51 peg B is a very interesting planet. It's, it's what we call a hot Jupiter. Um, so this is a planet that doesn't look like anything that we have in our solar system, really. Um, it's uh, about a Jupiter mass planet. It's actually about half a Jupiter mass. Um, and yet, it orbits very, very close to its host star. Um, so the Earth orbits at one astronomical unit. This planet orbits at about 5% of that distance um, on a very short orbital period, a 4.23 day orbital period. So this is very different from planets that we see in our own solar system, um, where gas giants like Jupiter are much further out, uh, further out beyond even Earth's orbit. Um, so we compare this to the innermost planet of our own solar system, which is Mercury. Um, and as you can see, Mercury has a much smaller mass, uh, even a much smaller mass than the Earth. Um, even Mercury does not orbit all that close to the Sun. It orbits on, a, on about a 90-day orbital period uh, at about 40% of, of the Earth's distance. Um, so this planet was, was not expected. We did not expect to see planets like Jupiter orbiting, uh, orbiting a star like the Sun so close. Um, and in fact, a lot of astronomers didn't even necessarily believe this discovery at first uh, because it just seemed so crazy and wacky and out there. This was not what we expected. Um, and yet it turns out, as, as the years went by and astronomers started to find more and more similar planets, uh, we now have a class of planets. We have a, a number of planets that are, no, uh, that are similar to this planet and are all called hot Jupiters. Um, this became 
uh, basically accepted knowledge. And, and now we really believe that, that yes, these objects are planets. And yes, you can have a Jupiter mass planet orbiting very, very close to a tow star. Um, and it turns out that hot Jupiters are not the only wild and crazy planets out there. Um, there are, there are plenty of, of very interesting planets that do not look like anything we have in our solar system. So this is just a, a scale diagram. Um, the yellow shows the orbits of the innermost planets of our solar system. Uh, so Jupiter would be further out than, than we can see on this slide. Um, and I've overlaid some of the orbits of some of the known extrasolar planets. And so we have, we have these hot Jupiters that orbit incredibly close to their host stars. We also have planets on very eccentric orbits uh, that swing very close to their host stars and then far away, which is also very different from what we see in our own solar system, where most of the planets are on, on fairly circular orbits in our own solar system. Um, so it seems like when it comes to exoplanets, really anything goes, and we have all kinds of planets out there that we weren't necessarily expecting. All right, so how do we find these planets? Um, I want to review some of that as well. Um, when it comes to detecting extrasolar planets, we have a problem, and that is that stars are very bright, and uh, planets are very dim and very small. So, uh, so it turns out to detect an extrasolar planet in general, we have to go to ind indirect detection methods, where basically we're going to observe the star and observe something about the light of the star that will allow us to infer the presence of a planet in orbit around that star. Um, so there's two main methods that have been used to detect most of the exoplanets that we know of uh, so far. Uh, the first one is called the Doppler or Wobble method. So the idea here is, so just as your planet is orbiting around its host star, the host star is also being pulled on by the gravity of the planet. Um, so you think about a star as being fixed in space, but actually this is, this is blown up to really, so that you can really see the effect. Uh, the star is being tugged on by the planet as well, so that both the planet and the star are orbiting around a point in the center known as the center of mass of the system. Um, so we can actually detect this motion of the star in the following sense. Uh, so if this is, this is a top-down view now, if this is the observer looking at the system, you can see that the star is now moving towards the observer and away from the observer, and then towards the observer again. Uh, if we now observe the spectrum of light emitted by the star, what we will see is as the star is moving towards us, the entire spectrum of light emitted by the star is going to be blue shifted, shifted towards the blue, and then as the, uh, the star moves away from us, the spectrum of light will be red shifted. Um, so we can detect the subtle blue shift and red shift in, uh, in the star's emitted light and use that to infer the presence of a planet in orbit. Um, and so there's a number of parameters of the planet that we can learn uh, from this method. Uh, the main one is that we can learn something about the mass of the planet. Um, and then additionally, we can learn about the orbital period of the planet, um, its orbital distance from the star, and we can even learn something about how circular its orbit is. Uh, the other method that has been used to find a number of uh, planets is known as the transit method, and this method is very complementary to the Doppler method. Uh, so here, if you happen to be aligned just right relative to your planetary system, you will see that the planet passes right in front of its host star as it goes around in its orbit. Uh, when a planet passes in front of its host star, it will block out a little bit of the star's light. And so what you'll actually see, if you're observing the amount of light emitted by your star as a function of time, you'll see this little dip, the small amount of missing light uh, that the planet is blocking out. Um, now from this method, from the size of this transit now, we can infer the size of the planet. Uh, so the size of this dip has something to do with the amount of light that's being blocked out, which has to do with the size of the planet. Um, so from the transit method, we get the size of the planet. And from the Doppler method, we get the mass of the planet. If, you have both, if you've independently detected your planet via both of these methods, we now have both. Um, if we put together both the radius, the size, and the mass of the planet, we can now learn about the density of the planet. Um, and this is where things start to get interesting, because now we can learn something about what the planet is composed of. If, if you find a planet that has a high density, it's maybe composed of rock or even iron. 
Um, whereas if you find a low density planet, uh, perhaps it's a gas giant planet, it's composed mostly of, of say hydrogen and helium gas. Um, a couple of important things also, um, you need to remember that not every planet transits. So you need to be aligned just right so that your planet actually passes in front of its host star. So there's plenty of planets out there that do not transit. So we will just, we will never find them via this method and therefore we will not be able to measure the size of the planet in this way. All right, so now I'm gonna step you forward in time from 1995 to the present day. Um, so this is a graph showing the uh, orbital period of the planet versus the planet's mass. Um, so we start in 1995 with just a single planet that's 51 peg B that I told you about before, uh, this very interesting hot Jupiter. Um, and now we're gonna step forward in time and look at the additional detections of exoplanets that have happened over the last 16 years. the color of the symbol denotes uh, how the, the planet was detected. There's, a, there's an additional uh, way to detect planets that I didn't talk about called microlensing, which is also on here. So as you can see, this diagram has filled out quite a bit. Uh, we now know of more than 500 exoplanets. Um, and we now have this great population of planets, so we can learn something about not just a single planet, but the whole population of planets that might be out there. Um, a couple things to remember about this diagram is that, uh, so the, the main thing to, to take away from this diagram is that this is not, this population of planets is not necessarily representative of the underlying population of planets that are out there. There's plenty of planets that still have not been detected, and there are intrinsic biases in our detection methods. Uh, so for example, uh, the Doppler method is more sensitive to higher mass planets, and the transit method is more sensitive to planets that are close into their host stars. Um, but something that I hope you notice as this diagram filled out is that we started to go from only finding planets uh, with, with higher masses to now finding planets with much lower masses, uh, 10 Earth masses and below. Uh, so we call these planets, planets with masses between one and 10 Earth masses, Super Earths. Uh, we simply call them Super Earths because they're somewhat more massive than the Earth. This doesn't necessarily mean anything about, uh, about these planets being Earth-like, uh, and probably many of these planets are not actually Earth-like, but they are somewhat more massive than the Earth, um, and, and for that they're very interesting. And the reason that we can now detect these planets is that our detection methods have become much more sensitive and refined over the years, so now we're, we're capable of finding these low mass planets where originally we were lucky to just find uh, a Jupiter mass planet. All right, so super Earths are interesting for a couple of reasons. One, um, it's sort of a proof of concept that we can now find these lower mass planets and it means that eventually we will be able to find something that's truly Earth mass. Um, but super Earths are interesting in their own right too um, for the following reason. So. Uh, so putting super-Earths in the, in the context of our solar system, in our solar system, we have basically two classes of planets. Um, we have our small rocky planets, and we have our larger gas or, uh, or ice giant planets. Um, and in between these two classes of planets, we don't have anything. So there's nothing in between Earth at one Earth mass and, and Neptune and Uranus around 17 Earth masses. So we don't have any super-Earths in our solar system. We've never seen one of these planets before. We don't know what they're like. We don't know if, if these planets more strongly resemble something like Neptune, or if they more strongly resemble something like Earth or Venus, or if there's some sort of, uh, sort of intermediate range in between where, where they look not quite like one and not quite like the other. Um, so, so we'd like to study these planets, uh, learn what they're composed of, what they're made up of, what their atmospheres are composed of, uh, and therefore learn something about uh, how these planets are made um, and, and how they got to be the way they are. So we are now entering what I like to call the age of the super-Earth. Uh, we're now detecting these planets. So there's a number of different surveys that have allowed us to, uh, to detect these planets using uh, different detection methods. So, uh, so there are a large number now of Doppler detections of super-Earths using high-resolution spectrographs on fairly large telescopes. Uh, the most successful being probably uh, HARPS, which is uh, a spectrograph uh, down in Chile, and also the high-res spectrograph on the Keck telescope in Hawaii. 
Uh, transit searches have also started to be successful at finding super Earths. So in general, when you do a transit search to find a small planet like a super Earth, uh, you want to go to space. You want to have your, your telescope up in space. The reason for that is that, um, so basically if you have a Jupiter, something Jupiter sized transiting in front of a star like the sun, that planet will block out about 1% of the light from the star. It will create about a 1% transit. And that's something that you can see from the ground. Whereas something the size of Earth transiting in front of a star like the sun will only block out 0.01% of the star's light. Um, and to get measurements that sensitive, it's, it's generally easiest if, if your telescope is up above Earth's atmosphere, up in space. Uh, so CORO is a space-based uh, transit survey. It was launched at the end of 2006. Uh, they have found one transiting super Earth. Um, there, there is one very successful ground-based survey that I'm going to tell you more about uh, later in this talk. Uh, and the way that you can detect super Earths from the ground is if you particularly target smaller stars, known as M-dwarfs. Um, and the reason for this is that if you only look at stars that are, say, a tenth of the size of the sun, then something like a super Earth will now block out a much larger fraction of the star's light. Um, so something like the Earth in front of an M star could create, say, a 1% transit, just like something like Jupiter in front of the sun. Um, and then finally, Kepler. Probably many of you know about Kepler. Uh, the operations are located just down the street at NASA Ames. Uh, so Kepler is a NASA transit search that was launched, another space-based satellite launched in, uh, in 2009. Um, and Kepler is going to find and has found uh, many, many transiting planets. Uh, so the idea behind Kepler, they monitor 100,000 stars in just one small corner of the sky uh, towards the constellation Cygnus. And the idea behind Kepler is to detect the first truly Earth-sized planet in an Earth-like orbit, so in a one-year orbit, uh, transiting in front of its star. Uh, so this mission was designed particularly to be able to find something like Earth uh, in, in a transiting configuration. And along the way, Kepler is going to find and already has found uh, quite a number of, of super-Earths um, and Earth-sized planets. Uh, so just to sum up some of the results so far, um, so I mentioned before uh, that Doppler searches have been very successful at finding super-Earths, about 25, or I think now we're actually up to something more like 28 uh, super-Earths have now been discovered uh, through Doppler searches, um, and actually nine, nine of those uh, have been found through transit searches uh, that are, are transiting super-Earths. So these are the ones where we're going to be able to learn something more about uh, the composition of the planet uh, through determining the planet's density. Um, and some other interesting results have come up along the way. Um, one is that super-Earths appear to be fairly common. Uh, so it looks right now like somewhere between 10 and 50 percent of Sun-like stars have at least one of these super-Earths in orbit around them. Um, this, this range is still fairly broad. Um, there's kind of a big difference between 10% and 50%. Uh, different groups have come up with, with different values here using their own uh, statistical methods. And what we hope to see down the road is that uh, as we get more data and, and these groups refine their methods, they, they converge to some value uh, somewhere in this range. So whether it's 50% or 10% is still an open question. Um, Another interesting result is that super-Earths seem to preferentially lie in multi-planet systems. So where you find one super-Earth, you tend to find another one. And this kind of points to something um, uh, something like our solar system being a good model for, for you know, most solar systems that are out there, where we have multiple uh, terrestrial planets in our own solar system. And, and it seems like many of these sun-like stars out there also have, have multiple uh, low-mass planets. Um, and finally, Kepler is now uh, producing some really beautiful results. And of the uh, 1,200 or so uh, Kepler planetary candidates that are out there right now, uh, 356 of them have uh, are, are candidate planets with radii less than two Earth radii. Um, so these are still considered to be candidate planets, 
Uh, we haven't confirmed that they truly are planets. We haven't uh, been able to do the Doppler follow-up to determine the mass of these planets. And it turns out that there's, there's some other astrophysical sources that, that can produce something that, that looks like a transit. So we really want to have the follow-up uh, to be really sure that, that all of these objects are truly planets. Um, but it looks like Kepler has at least found a fairly large number of, uh, of transiting super-Earths. And, and once we have the follow-up, we'll, we'll really uh, be able to know for sure. Um, if you include planets that are a little bit larger, up to, say, Neptune size, this number almost doubles. So in between Earth and Neptune size, uh, Kepler is finding hundreds of, of transiting candidates already. All right, take a quick sip of water. So we're finding all these planets. They're very exciting, they're very interesting. Uh, we have masses for most of them, we have radii for some of them, uh, if they happen to be transiting. Uh, but we wanna know more about these planets. We, we wanna know um, what they're composed of, and in particular we wanna know what their atmospheres are composed of. Uh, this will help us to eventually find you know, something with an Earth-like atmosphere or a Venus-like atmosphere. Um, so when we get the opportunity to observe a super-Earth atmosphere, we have a number of questions that we would like to ultimately answer. Um, and this is just sort of a laundry list of them. So we want to we wanna know what is the atmosphere composed of, uh, what kind of gases make up the atmosphere. Uh, we'd like to know something about the atmospheric structure. Um, and I just illustrate down here, so this is the atmospheric structure. This is what I mean by the atmospheric structure uh, for Earth. So this is Earth's uh, temperature as a function of its altitude. So most of you probably know that when you're at Earth's surface and you start going up in altitude, the temperature drops off. So you see that here. What you might not know is that Earth also has a layer that we call the stratosphere, where the temperature starts to rise again as a function of altitude. Um, and that's actually due to the presence of our ozone layer in our atmosphere that helps to heat up the atmosphere uh, fairly high above Earth's surface. Uh, so we'd like to see if, uh, if some of these planets out there have something like Earth's stratosphere um, and maybe learn something about what's causing that stratosphere, be it ozone or something else. Uh, we would like to know if there are clouds or cl clouds or hazes uh, in these planets' atmospheres. We know that, that most planets and planet-sized moons in our solar system have some sort of clouds, um, and that could potentially affect uh, what's going on at the surface of the planet. So, so this is another question that we'd like to, to probe and learn about. Um, another question that's particularly interesting to me is, uh, do super-Earths hold on to hydrogen atmospheres? So we know terrestrial planets in our own solar system, Earth and Venus, don't really have much hydrogen in their atmospheres. And the idea is that hydrogen long ago, any hydrogen that, that these planets had long ago escaped to space, whereas something more like Neptune has a very thick hydrogen atmosphere. Um, so these super-Earths, which are somewhere in between Earth and Neptune, uh, maybe they have hydrogen atmospheres, maybe they don't. Um, and this has also very interesting implications for climate, what's going on on the surface of the planet, et cetera. Uh, and finally, sort of the, the holy grail of, of looking at atmospheres of super-Earths is to assess questions of habitability. Um, is the planet habitable? Is the planet inhabited? Is there thriving life on the planet's surface? Um, these are complicated questions. People at SETI, I'm sure, work on, on many questions related to habitability. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much more about habitability in this talk other than, than this is a question that we, we eventually do want to be able to assess. All right, so we want to start learning about, about these planets. Um, and for transiting planets, we have successfully, we've already successfully measured the planet's mass and its radius. So we know its mass and its size. Uh, so we can put it on a diagram kind of like this, mass versus planet's radius. Um, you can see we have Earth and Venus and Uranus and Neptune already, already shown on here. Um, and these are curves for, for different overall composition of the planet, ranging from a planet that's composed of pure iron to pure rock to pure ice. Um, so if we place our planet on this diagram, you can see that Earth and Venus lie somewhere in between iron and rock uh, because they have rocky mantles and an iron core. Um, so just by placing your planet on this diagram, you can already 
potentially learn something about the overall composition of your planet. Um, so additionally, you can see Uranus and Neptune lie up above all of these curves. Uh, what this means is that anything in this blue region up above the ice curve have even lower densities than the lowest density solid material uh, that can make up a planet. So these, these uh, planets in this blue region ha are, have lower density than, than pure ice. And therefore, they need to be composed of something that's lower density or gas. Um, so planets in this blue region should have significant gaseous atmospheres, um, and most likely hydrogen or hydrogen and helium atmospheres. Uh, if your planet lands somewhere down in this region where we find Earth and Venus in between these various colored curves, uh, then the planet has probably all or mostly uh, solid composition. However, there is significant degeneracy in between these different types of planets in, uh, in the following sense. When you, uh, when you find your planet somewhere on this diagram, you don't necessarily know, is it composed of X percent iron and X percent rock and X percent ice? Uh, there's, there's a whole family of models that, that could fit a given planet. Um, so it can be actually difficult to fully assess what, are, what percentages of these different building blocks make up your planet. All right, so this is the same diagram as the previous diagram. Um, the, uh, the axes are just a little bit different. Uh, previous diagram had a logarithmic axis, and this is now a linear, linear axis. Um, but uh, so this is the same diagram, and now we've placed on it uh, all of the known transiting super-Earths. So you can see where our, uh, where our known planets lie on this diagram. Uh, so once again, the blue region shows uh, the region that, uh, where the planets need to have some sort of significant gaseous hydrogen-helium uh, atmosphere. Uh, this dashed line is, is the curve for a planet that's composed of 100% ice. Um, and as you can see, we have already great diversity in our, in our known uh, transiting super-Earths. So we have planets up in the blue region where they need to, be, they need to have significant hydrogen helium atmospheres. They're probably something more like Neptune. Um, we even have this one guy that's, that's even lower density or a couple guys that are lower density than Uranus and Neptune. Um, and then we have planets that fall firmly uh, in the category where they're probably made of mostly rock, actually. Uh, this planet right here, this one denoted in red, is a little bit more dense uh, than the Earth. It's probably even more iron rich compared to the Earth. Um, so we have great diversity in these planets and, um, and, and this is definitely interesting um, in that we now, we now see that, that there's a lot of different kinds of planets out there. It's not necessarily that these planets are going to fall along some simple relationship going from Earth up to Neptune. Uh, but, but once again, we only have a very small number of these planets still. So we want to continue to detect even more of these planets and, and find where they, where they continue to lie on this diagram. So um, for the rest of my time, I'm going to focus on this one particular planet, GJ1214b. Um, and as you can see, this planet lies in the blue region, just barely lies in the blue region of this plot, where its density is too low uh, to be explained by a solely solid planet. Um, and it needs to have some sort of significant atmosphere. Uh, so this is just a laundry list of, of the planetary parameters for GJ1214b. It's about a six and a half Earth mass planet, uh, 2.7 Earth radii, and if you put those two numbers together, you get out a density for this planet that's about two grams per centimeter cubed. Uh, so this doesn't necessarily mean much to you, um, but uh, to put it in context, Earth, Earth's density is about five and a half grams per centimeter cubed. Uh, so this planet has a much lower density than the Earth, uh, which uh, is why we think that this planet does indeed have a significant atmosphere, uh, gaseous atmosphere. Um, this planet orbits on a very short orbital period, very close to its host star. Uh, its orbital period is about 1.5 days. Uh, so this might make you think that this planet would be very hot if it's so close to its star. Um, however, this planet orbits uh, one of these small stars that I talked about before, one of these M stars. M stars are also, they're very small stars, but they're also very cool stars. So even though this planet is just exceptionally close to its host star, it is not all that hot. 
It is hotter than the Earth by quite a bit. It's uh, too hot to have, uh, say, liquid water on its surface. Um, but it's it's not extremely hot. It's it's not uh, it's not sort of out of the realm of of what we could even experience or uh, not experience, but uh, but you know, measurements that we could make in our lab. Uh, we we could uh, easily create temperatures at this sort of range. All right, so, uh, so GJ1214b orbits the small M star, and I just want to reiterate why, uh, why we're so interested in looking at M stars. Uh, so this is a small star, and this is the system drawn to scale. So if this is the star, this red circle is a star, uh, then this is the size of the planet as it transits in front of its star. So GJ1214b, uh, when it transits, blocks out about 1.4% of the star's light. Um, once again, this is the kind of measurement that we can make from the ground. And, uh, and even more interestingly, uh, because this planet blocks out so much of its star's light, it means that we can also do follow-up observations to learn about this planet's atmosphere. Previously, these types of studies, studies of the planetary atmosphere, were, uh, were really limited to planets of Jupiter size, or approximately Jupiter size, larger planets uh, orbiting in front of sun-like stars. But now, with this particular system, we can do the same kinds of uh, follow-up studies to learn about the planet's atmosphere. All right, so I want to show you, uh, just take a quick digression and show you what the observatory looks like that actually found GJ1214b. Um, so the observatory is called the MIRTH Observatory. Um, MIRTH has eight small telescopes, so just 16-inch telescopes. This is the kind of telescope that you could have in your backyard. Um, has eight of these 16-inch telescopes, and, uh, and MIRTH works under a particular observing strategy. And I'm going to I'll talk as I start this movie. Um, so you can see now just four of the, of the eight MIRTH telescopes. Um, so what MIRTH does is it particularly targets 2,000 of the brightest M stars in the sky. So now you can see the telescopes moving. They were just, they're doing some calibration. And now it's getting dark and they're starting to observe. Um, so, this, so each of these telescopes, uh, the role of, of the set of eight telescopes is to monitor these 2,000 uh, of the brightest M stars in the sky. Um, and, and they want to see if any of these stars has a transiting planet. Uh, so in particular, they look at they target each star, and then they have to return to each star on a regular interval. Uh, and this is because you don't want to you don't want to miss the transit. Uh, so they they observe each of these two thousand stars at, at a regular interval, um, and and they do this by putting together the work of all eight telescopes together. Uh, so this is this is a pretty different observing strategy from uh, from probably what any of you have ever seen if you've. Uh, use a telescope or even use a telescope in your backyard where you kind of look at one spot in the sky for a longer period of time. These guys are really kind of bouncing around all over the place. Uh, as you can see, it's getting light, but this is actually this is not sunrise, it's actually moonrise. Uh, so the moon is pretty bright, it's sort of problematic uh, to astronomers. They continue to observe and then we have some clouds coming in, which is also going to badly affect this particular night of observing. Uh, so these uh, telescopes just continue to do this all night, every night, um, and collect data. And then it's, uh, it's the astronomer's job to actually find if any of these stars did indeed uh, produce something that looked like a transit. Um, another interesting issue with these telescopes. Uh, <laughs> so I guess you guys can all see this. Um, you get its little paw prints on the telescope. Um, so, so this is, I guess, an issue of observing on a mountaintop in a, a desert climate with an open roof dome. Um, so there's wildlife out there. Um, so something is walking on the, on the telescopes, and, and this is not so great for the mirror of the telescope, obviously. Um, so they put out some traps and, <laughs> and caught this little guy. Um, so this is called a ring-tailed cat. I don't know if anyone has ever seen one of these. I have not. Uh, I th they're, uh, they're part of the raccoon family, and they're, uh, they're native to mountaintops uh, in Arizona and in, in the Southwest. Um, so I believe they caught this guy and released him somewhere else. No harm was done to this poor animal, um, but he's not walking on the telescopes anymore. 
All right, so back to GJ1214B. Uh, so uh, this is so far the first and only uh, transiting super-Earth that has been found by the MIRTH uh, survey. Um, and I, I showed you before that, uh, that this planet does have a low density. Um, so it turns out we can fit the, uh, we can fit this planet's mass and radius and, and low density with a couple of different classes of models. Uh, so one possibility is that the planet has a rocky or rocky and icy interior and a fairly thick hydrogen, hydrogen helium atmosphere. Um, this atmosphere should also probably have, uh, even though it's composed mostly of hydrogen, it should probably have other uh, trace constituents, water, methane, ammonia, CO2, et cetera. Um, the other possibility is that this planet is incredibly water rich. Um, we call this the water world scenario. Um, in this case, the planet would be composed of mostly water ice with a thick uh, water steam atmosphere as opposed to uh, a hydrogen atmosphere. Um, so we'd like to know which case is actually correct. Uh, wh which, of these, which of these scenarios is actually correct for this planet? And the way that we're going to have to do this um, is to observe the planet's atmosphere. Uh, to try to tell the difference between an atmosphere that's composed of mostly hydrogen versus one that's composed of mostly water. Um, and now I need to tell you how we actually observe atmospheres of exoplanets. Uh, so there's two main ways that, that we can do this. Uh, both really only work for transiting systems. Uh, so most atmospheric studies have been done for, uh, for planets that do transit. Uh, the first way you can do this is to observe the planet's atmosphere on a mission. Um, so the way we're actually going to do this is we're going to observe the planet not during transit when it passes in front of its host star, but half an orbit later when it passes behind its host star. Uh, so right before the planet passes behind its host star, you are seeing the light from the star and the light from the planet. When it passes behind its host star, now you're only seeing the light from the star. Uh, so you'll get something that looks kind of like a transit, but much smaller. Uh, so we call this secondary eclipse, and this is essentially the missing light from the planet as it disappears behind its star. Uh, if we now observe the secondary eclipse at different wavelengths, we can learn something about the spectrum of light that's emitted by the planet, um, and then we can learn something about what the planet is composed of, etc. The other way to observe an exoplanet atmosphere is now during transit. Uh, we call this transmission spectroscopy, and, and what, the way that this works is when the planet transits in front of its host star, most of the planet just blocks out light from its star, um, but some of the light from the star will actually pass right through the upper atmosphere of the planet. The planet's atmosphere is made up of different species, different atoms and molecules, uh, and those atoms and molecules absorb light at certain characteristic wavelengths. Uh, so this is an example shown here, it's kind of small, sorry, um, where the planet has some uh, sodium in its atmosphere. And so what you see during transit is that a little bit more light is absorbed at the wavelengths of these, uh, of these sodium lines uh, than at other wavelengths. And we attribute this to the presence of sodium in the planet's atmosphere. So we can use this trick to, uh, to try to detect different atomic and molecular species in the planet's atmosphere and to learn something about the composition of the planet's atmosphere. So for GJ1214b, we particularly want to try to tell the difference between an atmosphere that's composed mostly of hydrogen and one that's composed mostly of water. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, the best way to do this is by actually doing transmission spectroscopy, uh, so observing the planet uh, as it transits. And this is because transmission spectroscopy turns out to be very sensitive to the overall bulk composition of the planet's atmosphere. I'm going to step through how this works. All right, so um, it's your light passing through the upper atmosphere of the planet, going to the telescope. Um, and if the planet's atmosphere is, is fairly sort of low density, puffed up, uh, you will observe this kind of transmission spectrum. So this is transit depth as a function of wavelength, and you can see that you have these various uh, spectral features this is just a cartoon, but, but you see these uh, deeper absorption at certain wavelengths than others. Um, so if you were to observe the same 
atmosphere, but instead this atmosphere is denser, more compact. Um, instead, you will see a transmission spectrum that looks more like this. So all of the spectral features are still there, they're just smaller. Um, so the way this translates into learning about water atmosphere versus hydrogen atmosphere is that a hy hydrogen um, is lighter, it's gonna produce a more puffed up atmosphere, and so you should see deeper spectral features in the transmission spectrum. Whereas if you have a water atmosphere, water's heavier, the atmosphere is gonna be more compact, uh, you will see much smaller uh, features in transmission by about a factor of 10 or so. So what we have done, now I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna be showing you spectra for the rest of this talk, so bear with me. Uh, what we have done is uh, actually gone out and uh, first just tried to model what the transmission spectrum of GJ1214B uh, could potentially look like. So we've looked at cases uh, with different atmospheric composition ranging from, all right, so these, these top three are all hydrogen rich atmospheres. Uh, we've looked at, at solar composition gas. Uh, we've also looked at atmospheres where we basically started with solar composition gas but, uh, but upped the amount of what we call metals, so basically carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, anything other than, um, anything other than hydrogen and helium. Um, and as you can see here, those three sets of models produce these large spectral features in transmission. Whereas uh, for heavier, uh, atmospheres made of, of heavier molecules, water, water and CO2, or just CO2, we get these much smaller uh, spectral features in transmission. I've just I've blown up uh, this part of the figure down here so that you can actually see that there is uh, excess absorption at certain wavelengths, uh, even though it looks kind of flat up here. It's just that the spectral features for, for the water atmosphere and for the heavier uh, molecule atmospheres are just scaled down by about a factor of 10. Uh, so this is gonna be how we're gonna tell the difference between a water atmosphere and a hydrogen atmosphere on this planet. Um, and I said before that we can actually make these kinds of observations, so, so this is the kicker here. Uh, for the hydrogen-rich atmospheres, the, the red, the light blue, and the green line, uh, our models, uh, the prediction that we get is that we should see changes in transit depth as a function of wavelength on the order of 0.1 to 0.3%. Um, so this is, these are small changes, but uh, these are the types of observations. We can make observations with this level of, of uh, precision right now with current telescopes, uh, current instruments, both on the ground and from space. Uh, so what this means is that if the planet's atmosphere is hydrogen rich, hydrogen dominated, we should be able to actually measure the planet's transmission spectrum and to look for these spectral features. I just want to quickly mention that we also modeled um, emission spectra for the same planet, uh, for the same six cases of atmospheric composition. It turns out that for the time being, emission spectra are less interesting, and that's because uh, our current infrared capabilities uh, only allow us to go out to about five microns uh, using uh, space telescope Spitzer. Uh, the problem here is that, as you can see, the expected signals that we get in our emission spectrum at these shorter wavelengths in the infrared are not very large. Um, so it turns out that uh, we're probably not going to be able to measure anything interesting about this planet's emission spectrum for the time being. Um, however, when next generation telescopes come online, uh, JWST, whenever JWST does fly, uh, and we can access longer wavelengths, we should potentially be able to measure this planet's emission spectrum as well. All right, so we have data now. Uh, this is now the, the first observation of a super Earth atmosphere. Uh, so this result came out uh, in the winter. Uh, we now have what, 11 data points. We have a little spectrum um, from the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, in Chile. Uh, so I've shown what the data looked like on, on the previous plot that showed the transmission spectrum, and then now this is uh, zoomed in to show the actual uh, the actual uh, data from the discovery paper. Um, so what do we see? Well, it turns out we see a very flat 
transmission spectrum. Um, so this is consistent with what we were expecting for a water-rich atmosphere, a water, uh, a water atmosphere. So it would be tempting now to say, this planet's atmosphere is composed of water. Great. Um, unfortunately, we can't make that conclusion yet. <laughs> uh, I see someone shaking their head. No, we cannot conclude that. Um, so what we can say is we are inconsistent with the model that I showed you before of a hydrogen-rich atmosphere. And down here, that's shown with the orange line. We're inconsistent with, with that. Um, but there may be physics that we did not include in our original uh, fairly simple model. Um, and, and one uh, particular thing that we've been concerned about is clouds. Um, so it turns out that if there are any kind of clouds in this planet's atmosphere, uh, even if the atmosphere is composed of mostly hydrogen, clouds will tend to flatten out the transmission spectrum at short wavelengths. Um, so what we can say is that our initial hydrogen-rich composition was ruled out. Uh, water-rich compositions are consistent with our data. Turns out anything more than 20% water by volume is consistent with our data. Um, but the other alternative explanation is that some kind of high-altitude clouds or hazes are present, and the planet's atmosphere is still actually a hydrogen-dominated atmosphere. Uh, so what we want to do is take now take data at additional wavelengths. In particular, we want to take data at longer wavelengths. Um, and that's because if there are clouds or hazes present, they should not affect uh, the planet's spectrum uh, so much at longer wavelengths. So we want to look now at longer wavelengths in the infrared. Uh, so now that was done uh, using data from the Spitzer Space Telescope. So now these are two data points out at 3.6 and 4.5 microns. Uh, this is now additional data, and again, the spectrum is flat. Um, so once again, you want to say, okay, this is a water-rich atmosphere, um, where all the data are very nicely consistent with this blue line. But once again, we can't make that conclusion. Um, and that's because these are only two additional data points, and they might just have gotten unlucky and observed at the wrong wavelengths where you didn't expect to see some kind of large uh, variation in the transit depth. Uh, and that would be the case uh, if the planet's atmosphere does not, if it's hydrogen rich, but it does not have methane. Um, so that's shown with this uh, light green line right here. Um, and why would the planet's atmosphere not have methane? Well, it turns out that methane can be fairly easily destroyed by UV light um, from the host star so the idea here is that maybe methane would normally be present, but it's just being destroyed. Uh, so there's no methane, and therefore at, at these wavelengths, the spectrum also looks flat. Um, so we want to take more data, get more wavelength coverage. You're seeing a pattern here. Oh, this is just what I just said. Uh, we're consistent with a water-rich composition, but the alternative is a no-methane atmosphere. So even more data. Um, we get data in Hawaii at the CFHT the uh, Canada-France-Hawaii telescope. Um, and this is now data at uh, J-band, which is about 1.2 microns, and K-band, which is about 2.2 microns. Um, and now, lo and behold, we see what we were expecting for a hydrogen-rich atmosphere. We see uh, a deeper transit at K-band and a shallower transit at J-band. So pretty much the only way that you can get this large change in transit depth as a function of wavelength is if the planet's atmosphere is composed of lightweight material like hydrogen, hydrogen and helium. Uh, so this seems to be the smoking gun that yes, uh, the planet's atmosphere is made up of mostly hydrogen. All right, so we've gone back and done some more modeling now. Uh, we wanna see if we can come up with, uh, with a spectrum, a modeled spectrum, that can actually fit all of the available data. Um, and it turns out that, that we can, but it might not be really physically motivated. Um, so uh, the light gray line, once again, just shows uh, uh, the spectrum that I've shown multiple times before for solar composition gas. Um, and as you can see, many of the data points are not consistent with that model. Uh, the dashed line shows what we expect for a water world, a water-dominated atmosphere. And the dark gray line 
shows our, our model that best fits all of the available data. And to do this, we took solar composition gas, we took out the methane, and we essentially added in uh, some high altitude clouds. Uh, and that allows us to fit <clears throat> all of the available data. This problem of removing methane, though, keeps coming up. Um, we just took the methane out. But uh, it turns out that when we do uh, some more sophisticated modeling of the photochemistry of this planet, uh, what happens when the UV light actually hits this planet um, is that we have a lot of trouble removing uh, most of the methane, uh, at least at the altitudes that are probed uh, using transmission spectroscopy. Uh, so even though we can just take methane out of our model, um, it turns out that in reality, this, uh, this might not really work. Um, so we definitely have some more work to do here. Um, and, and one thing that you might notice is that all of these conclusions hinge very much upon this one data point, uh, this one K-band data point. If, you, if, this, if, if there's something wrong with this data point, if there's something wrong with the way that the data were, anal were analyzed, then everything is consistent with the flat line, and we have this very nice picture that the planet's atmosphere is water rich. Um, so you have to ask yourself if you believe this, this one data point. Um, and I have to say for the time being, I do. Um, the people who, uh, who took uh, these particular uh, data have reproduced this measurement now uh, four or five times, and they always get the same answer. So uh, there's ongoing work here. There's some more people who are uh, uh, separate groups who are going to go and reobserve uh, at at this particular wavelength and see if they get the same result. Um, because if that point changes, then then our conclusions uh, can vastly change. All right. So where do we stand right now? Uh, remaining possibilities for the atmosphere of GJ twelve fourteen B. Um, it could have a water rich composition. Uh, has to be at least twenty percent water. Um, if you don't believe that one K-band data point. Uh, otherwise, the spectrum might be affected by clouds and or hazes, which are affecting then the, short wave, the shorter wavelength data. Uh, also, non-equilibrium chemistry could be contributing to removing methane uh, from an atmosphere where we would otherwise expect methane to be present. So ultimately, we definitely need more data to really sort out what's going on uh, with this planet's atmosphere. Um, and we probably need some more sophisticated uh, modeling efforts as well. All right, so just want to wrap up uh, with this uh, one last point, uh, which is that GJ1214b is a very special super-Earth. It orbits a small star, uh, produces a deep transit. It allows us to do these kinds of follow-up observations to learn about the planet's atmosphere right now. Uh, However, most super-Earths orbiting a larger star more like the sun, uh, we can't do these kinds of observations right now. Uh, instead, we need to wait for next generation facilities, next generation telescopes to come online. They're going to have better sensitivity. Um, in particular, JWST is something that we're very much looking forward to, although now we don't know when it's actually going to fly. Um, and this is just a simulation uh, showing what JWST should be able to do in terms of characterizing uh, both water and CO2 features uh, in transmission for, uh, for a hot super-Earth and uh, even for a super-Earth, a cooler super-Earth that's, that's positioned in its star's habitable zone where it could potentially have liquid water uh, on the planet's surface. So this is something that JWST should ultimately be able to do down the line. It requires a lot of telescope time, um, but, but this, is, this is where we're going, is trying to observe the atmospheres of, uh, of these truly uh, potentially habitable super-Earths. All right, so just to sum up what I've uh, said throughout the talk, uh, super-Earths are planets that, are, that have masses between 1 and 10 times that of the Earth. There are no super-Earths in our own solar system, but they appear to be uh, quite a few of these stars orbiting, uh, orbiting nearby, or quite a few of these planets orbiting nearby stars. Um, Additionally, super-Earths uh, probably do exhibit a very wide range of atmospheres, ranging from hydrogen-rich atmospheres to water atmospheres, probably CO2 atmospheres, even nitrogen atmospheres, et cetera. Uh, so this is why we want to actually observe the atmospheres of these planets. Um, 
Interior modeling is an interesting way to learn about uh, what these planets could be composed of, be it rock or iron or ice, et cetera. Um, but to unequivocally figure out what these planets are composed of, it's very helpful to observe the planet's atmosphere. Uh, super Earths in general should be detectable with next generation uh, facilities such as JWST. Uh, for now, we have certain special cases, uh, particularly for now, or one special case, which is GJ1214b, where we can observe the atmosphere uh, now, and that's because the planet orbits a small star. Um, and GJ1214b's atmosphere so far cannot be explained with simple models. Um, if we include a combination of clouds and non-equilibrium chemistry, we can start to potentially figure out uh, what is going on with this planet's atmosphere. Eliza, can I ask the first question? Mm -hmm. With uh, GJ twelve fourteen B, what sort of transit? Uh, what sort of uh, uh, integration times do you have for the uh, emission method that you're using? Sorry, for the transit time that you transmission method, transmission method that you use. Um, so, well, so we're taking the the way that we do is we we're taking data through the entire transit. Um, so we're basically we're basically getting a transit light curve right. at each wavelength. But those um, spectra were just limited to. Yeah. So from the full from the full transit light curve, where I mean we're sampling, um, I can't remember the exact integration times, but they're you know minutes. I mean because we want to sample through the whole transit. That's that's an hourish long. Um, we we take that and we fit for an actual transit depth, and you know through the fitting that that whole light curve, we fit for a transit depth, and then that's what we're ultimately plotting on those spectra is just the transit depth as a function of wavelength. And you're not doing any summing over several observations or anything like that to get the spectrum? Um, so most of these did sum over multiple transits. Um, so the, the first set of data I showed summed over two transits. Um, the, the last set of data I showed summed over, um, so you could actually see there were multiple data points on there, there were like uh, three or four, uh, depending on the wavelength, and then, and then yeah, they summed over over all of the transits. Uh, but each transit for the uh, for the case or for both cases, we get consistent results on single transits. It's just that, that summing over multiple transits allows us to, to get more precise measurements, smaller error bars. Hi. Um, I had a, a quick clarification question and then like a real question. The clarification was on the mass radius slide. It seemed okay. to go up to 30 masses and but you said it was the nine Transiting super Earths, and some of them seem to have masses over ten Earths. So oh, I'm yeah, a yeah. confused. Oh yeah. Um, sorry. Old fashioned way. Ah, sorry. Yeah. So this plot shows up to thirty Earth masses. Um, is that what, that's what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the the super Earths, the super Earths are technically the planets between one and ten. Okay. Earth so you just included so, a few. Axes. Yeah. So this so this plot, I just took I took it from a paper where they included things out to out to 30 Earth masses, because they were showing some of these sort of uh, Uranus and Neptune-like planets cool. as well. Um, but yeah, this, this was the piece of the diagram that I wanted you to focus on, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, and the, the real question is, so you, you said that the uh, probable temperature was about 550 Kelvin, yeah. and I remember, and uh, I'm thinking in terms of the of the Earth's own stratosphere and, and other lo layers, could, if there's a partial water could there be some kind of wacky partial water hydrogen atmosphere with radically different temperatures drilling down into the planet? Have you tried modeling that? So like you might get say liquid water and hydrogen gas or something. So um, the, the modeling that people have done of the interior of the planet uh, show that, that it should never be liquid. It should be, it should be super critical, super critical fluid um, for a layer, but, but it, never, it never goes through the liquid phase at all. Um, it's always too hot. Um, I mean, so well, so the, the I mean, the equilibrium temperature of the planet um, is is pretty set by by basically the planet's proximity to its star and and its albedo. Um, so that's I mean, even if there's variations in temperature through the planet's atmosphere, it should still always always stick above above the region uh, where the water should should turn into liquid phase. Hi. Your last slide said you were looking forward to um, 
JWST, but you also said future generations of ground-based telescopes. In particular, what are you anticipating? Um, so the next generation of like 30-meter class telescopes, extremely large telescopes, ELTs, um, should also be able to, to do some of this kind of work. Just a sort of a comment and, and, and a question with regard to water. The 550K is what? Is that a median temperature or is it? So that's a, just, that's a calculated equilibrium temperature. What does that mean? Um, so that's just based on the amount of light from the planet that's hitting the, the amount of light from the star that's hitting the planet, um, you know, just heating the planet. So the um, interior of the planet is at what temperature? Hotter. I mean, it, it'll, that, that's the temperature that the planet is essentially emitting at. Um, and then, oh, I, see. I mean, in any planet, as you, as you go further into the interior, it's going to heat up. Um, so you're well above the, the critical point, as you said, yes. of water. So you go from, not steam, but vapor, <laughs> vapor. Right. Vapor, 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 vapor. And, and then you, you go cross, super, then, then. Well, it's all, you, then you have a range of densities, yeah. including liquid densities. And then you cross the vapor solid boundary, and now you have ice. ice. But it's not going to be, what are the pressures? High. I mean, so I mean, yeah, these are high ices. Though. Yeah, yeah. So it's not, it's not, it's not ice in the phase that we're used to thinking of. You know, cold ice on the on the surface of, of the okay, Earth. Okay, so that's a fascinating model. Really. Yeah. But you have, you will have a range of liquid densities. Yeah, but they won't. It won't. It won't go. The in this part of in this part of the water phase diagram, it goes straight from vapor yeah. to supercritical fluid. Over to, a range of densities, though, yeah, is what I'm talking yeah, about. There's, yeah. there's no liquid phase. They're all right, in the right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you hit all, I mean, you hit the whole range of densities right, when you go there, right. yeah. Yeah, so talk, uh, talking about that density, uh, the slide you just brought a few minutes ago for this fellow, showed the, uh, this planet to be just outside the uh, pure ice. And I think on one of the slides, either around that one or prior, prior to it, you showed the density, I believe, maybe I'm mistaken, mm -hmm. of the planet being 1.9 grams per cubic centimeter. Mm -hmm. Well, that's almost twice water. So what's happening there? Um, so that's the net density. Um, that's like, that's the bulk density of the planet. So you have to remember that as, I mean, as, as you go further into the interior of the planet, um, then, uh, you know, what you think of as regular ice will become more dense, right? It compresses that much? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, so I mean, if, if you had, if you had a, a planet that was just composed of pure ice, um, you know, as, as you get further into the planet, that ice will have, have a higher and higher density naturally. Hey, Eliza, thanks very much. Uh, we have a uh, special SETI Institute mug, uh, antique mug for you. Thank you. All right, your talk. And please join me in thanking Eliza for a great talk.